I'm really, really happy to see, to see Steve Buck, our skipper, and Mary Ann, our uh, does everything else <laughs> deck hand first mate right now, although Ren is our first mate officially now. But um, so our three crew members are sitting there. We'll bring them up in just a minute. Um, and then we have Barbara Cooney has also been crew and one of our hosts for when people visit the boat. And Jerry Condon is also here. He's the president of, of the Golden Rule Committee that does the day-to-day -day operations, maintenance, planning, and all of that for the Golden Rule Project. But I do want to start out with a background in history so that people understand why we're here and what happened before 1958 and led up to the original sailing of the Golden Rule. At the end of World War II, Albert Bigelow, the first captain of the Golden Rule, was near Pearl Harbor when the explosions of Hiroshima and Nagasaki took place. He was a month before he could have retired with full pay, and he quit his commission out of protest of the dropping of those bombs. So he was already a veteran for peace. So right after that, from 1946 to 1958, the United States dropped 60, well, they used 67 nuclear weapons in the Marshall Islands. And it's a long ways away, so they figured, well, nobody would ever, there'd be no impact on many people. So you go to, from California to Hawaii, that's about 2,000 some miles, and then you go that much more, and that's where you get to the Marshall Islands. So it's a very long ways away. The nuclear weapons that were being tested by the United States and many other countries by that time were producing elements that don't exist in nature, one of which is strontium-90 that chemically acts like calcium and therefore was getting into babies' teeth and bones and mother's milk and cow's milk and people were measuring radiation in their milk before they would feed it to their babies. Everyone was really upset about this radiation and wondering what it was going to do to our bodies. And there was a pretty big movement even before the Golden Rule sailed to try to stop this. People were demonstrating in the streets, trying to contact Congress and the president, writing letters to the editor, and the things that they were doing didn't seem to be taking hold and producing any traction. So this group of Committee for Nonviolence, including about half Quakers, decided to buy a boat and sail her right into the nuclear testing zone in the Marshall Islands. They headed out of San Pedro near, near Los Angeles and made it to Honolulu on their second try and resupplied and headed out toward the Marshall Islands and they didn't get very far before the boat was brought back by the Coast Guard and the crew arrested for all kinds of different small things, but one of which was their intent to sail into the uh, Marshall Islands, which had been declared against an Atomic Energy Commission rule. They called it the Golden Rule rule. The, <laughs> the US government didn't really want people to sail in there and put their lives in the way to stop this testing. A second boat, the Phoenix of Hiroshima, was uh, during the trial of the original crew, the second boat uh, was docked a couple slips down from the Golden Rule. And they, it was, so Dr. Earl Reynolds, the captain of that boat, had spent three years studying the effects of radiation in children at, in Hiroshima. And during his time in Hiroshima, he had commissioned a boat to be built so that he and his family could sail all around the world. So they finished the, he finished his work and spent three years sailing around the world. And then they were coming back home to Hiroshima when they had to go through Hawaii. They stopped in Alawai Harbor in Honolulu. And ultimately they decided, this was you know, Earl and his wife Barbara and their, their son Ted and their daughter Jessica and a Japanese crewman who had lost his brother in the bombing of Hiroshima all decided that they would sail towards the Marshall Islands and decide then at the last minute whether to go into the testing zone, which they did. And Dr. Reynolds was uh, put on trial for 
He underwent two years of trials in Honolulu. As a result of what these two boats did and the rest of the crew of the Golden Rule in particular, there were a lot of protests all around the world. And that produced an even bigger anti-nuclear movement which gave President Kennedy the cover that he needed to sign the limited test ban treaty of 1963. And the tactic for using a boat to go up and get in the way of nuclear testing is what inspired Greenpeace to do the same in 1971. We interact with Greenpeace every now and then. They just installed a new executive director and they still, of course, acknowledge the origin of their, uh, their project. The Golden Roll was sold into private hands. It was a pleasure boat for many, many years and turned up in Northern California, Humboldt Bay, which is where Steve is from. Hey. And it was a pretty much of a wreck at the time that she was banged against a dock in a gale and developed two big holes in her side and sank. The boatyard owner wanted to use her for a bonfire, but he consulted his friend, uh, Chuck DeWitt, who lives a mile away, and said, hey, come on over here. Let's use this boat for a bonfire. And Chuck came over. He said, what the hell is the golden roll? And Leroy pointed to her sorry shape, and there she is. Well, ultimately, a discussion ensued. And Chuck, being a Vietnam veteran, a member of Veterans for Peace, brought in a bunch of his friends. And Veterans for Peace and Quakers and a lot of other volunteers decided they wanted to restore the golden rule, not just physically, but to her anti-nuclear mission. So it took five years. And in February of 2020, I'm sorry, February of 2015, so it was 2010 she sank, 2015 she got finished. Um, Jerry and I were living in an RV at the time. We answered the call to come to the boatyard and finish the Golden Rule. And pretty soon, uh, we needed a crew application form so people could be on the, on the crew. And I had been a computer programmer. I put one up online and I tested it. That was a foolish thing to do. <laughs> because a month later, they informed me they were thinking of having me for crew as on the Golden Rule. And I said, well, I've never even been on a sailboat. <laughs> what are you thinking? They would say, well, we're thinking that you would be a good public speaker for us. And I, I've never done that either. You'll be fine. All right. <laughs> so, so along we went, and we went down to uh, San Diego and um, you know, started doing these ports of call where we come into a port and we talk with people about nuclear issues today. And we went all along the west coast from Canada to Mexico, and then we went two years around the Hawaiian Islands, which is where I met Barbara. She still lives in Honolulu. And, and so, we were wanting to go to the Marshall Islands as the original crew wanted to do at a time when President Trump and Chairman Kim were threatening each other's country with nuclear war. And as Jerry says in the film that we're not showing today, um, we need to go back into the Pacific and see what we can do to stop the possibility of this impending nuclear war. So we sailed from California all around the Hawaiian Islands. We were headed to the Marshall Islands. And we had our crew and boat all ready to go. And it was March of 2020. So no public presentations. Countries were closing down. And we decided to cancel the trip due to COVID, which was a big disappointment. But we brought the Golden Rule back to the United States and started thinking about what's next. And as things started opening up a little bit, we decided to achieve the goals of the original people that had built the golden rule for the, those long five years, which was to sail all over the navigable waters of the United States. And so, we came up with this plan to sail around the, the whole eastern half of the United States. 
Normally, when you're going to do the great loop, which many sailors and um, motor boaters do, you don't actually do it in a sailboat because you have to take the masts down twice. You can't go through the Erie Canal with masts up, and you can't come out of Chicago down into the Illinois River with your masts up. And it's a little bit of a pain to deal with, with sails when you're on the Great Loop, but that's the boat we have. And you don't normally start in Minneapolis. It's not on the Great Loop. We, we have a very powerful Veterans for Peace chapter there that works with Mothers Against Military Madness and other groups, and they insisted that we come there. And after three times of saying no, we said yes. So that's where we started. We were going to go down the whole Mississippi River and ended up diverting over into the Ohio, Tennessee, and Tom Bigby rivers because of the drought on the lower Mississippi, well, on the whole Mississippi. How many times did we run aground? 20? But fortunately, it's, it's sandy and muddy, and it didn't hurt the boat. We took her out of the water when we got to Florida to take a look, and it was, it was fine. Uh, so then we went around um, the tip of Florida. We spent 10 days in Cuba and then started heading up north, and now we're on our way to north of Portland, Maine, and then we'll come back and do the um, Hudson River, Erie Canal, Oswego Canal, and all around the Great Lakes before we come back out in Chicago. Um, so that's where we are now. And you were talking about hope, and that's what the golden rule does, is it gives people hope through action. We talk about the new United Nations Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. So internationally, there's now hope that we can eliminate them if we take that and use it as a tool. We talk about the back from the brink measures, such as taking the weapons off of hair trigger alert and eliminating the $2 trillion program to create a whole new set of nuclear weapons and missiles and command and control systems that $2 trillion could be used in a lot of different ways. So that's the back from the brink measures. And then sometimes when I'm working with um, younger people, we'll get out paper and crayons and things, and we'll, we'll enable, empower them in the same way that the Hiroshima children were empowered, that you'll see this exhibit later. And I'll tell them about that. I said, you know, these these children went through something horrible. And later, they drew what they had seen or what they were thinking about. And I find that those drawings are very powerful. I got to see the exhibit in Seattle once. And so I say, you know, just because you're young doesn't mean you don't have a voice. So, you know, get out those crayons and think about what you think about peace or the golden rule or nuclear disarmament, something just kind of Put your thoughts out there in, a, in an artistic way. And then finally, there's the nuclear posture review. So every administration of recent past comes up with how nuclear weapons fit in with the entire US security structure. And they have been saying, well, nuclear weapons are the core of this structure. They're also the highest profit item. That might have something to do with it. It's very aggressive, um, tries to implement full spectrum dominance of the planet. And what our nuclear posture review did was to take a look at the relationship between the United States the, and the other nuclear armed countries plus Iran and thought about how do we bring down the tensions, how do we, what could we give our diplomatic corps to negotiate for an end to nuclear weapons. And there's a lot of great information in there. There's a few copies on the back table there. And what we did, this was through the Veterans for Peace Nuclear Abolition Working Group. And so then um, a few days ago, we ran all over the halls of Congress. Every uh, representative and senator now has a copy with an encouragement to support HRES 77, the bill which is, is called the Back from the Brink Bill, but it, it calls on Congress to support the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons and the other measures to make us safer before nuclear weapons get completely eliminated. 
One other thing I would like to talk about, and I, I don't want to steal anybody's thunder, but I would like to acknowledge that who was bombed in Hiroshima and Nagasaki? Brown people. Who was the victim of our testing in the Marshall Islands? Brown people. Who are the victims of uranium mining and, and testing in Nevada? The indigenous brown people of the, what we call the United States. So I would like to just acknowledge the racism involved in the whole nuclear cycle. Um, and of course there's sexism involved in well, as well. One thing is that the amount of radiation that is allowed or measured or standards um, used is based on a young white man. And it turns out that a baby girl will experience seven times the effect of the standard man. So it's important to know that that's another picture. I see that here we have a lot of women in the room and I, th I think that it's important to raise up the voices of women in everything we do. And if you find yourself faced with a panel or ideas that only in includes men or white people or um, people whose voices that are already heard a lot, might want to think about who else might be out there to invite into your circle. So that's kind of uh, what I wanted to say, and I would now like to, um, if you can and, and are willing, could we bring up the crew? My name's Stephen Buck. I'm uh, from Humboldt Bay, California, and uh, the Golden Rule was rebuilt in Humboldt Bay. Yeah, uh, by my sailing community. The people in my sailing community participated in that. And uh, after it was all done, I was actually working on uh, decommissioning a nuclear power plant in Humboldt Bay at the time. And after my job was done and their job was done, they asked me to skipper the Golden Rule down to San Diego and possibly to Hawaii. Well, that didn't work. I, I, we got offshore and I got sick. And we turned around, came back, and that started a, a series of attempts to go to Hawaii, which they eventually uh, were able to accomplish with a different crew and a different engine and a different plan. But uh, I've been in and out of uh, working with the Golden Gruel uh, team and crew for uh, about four years now. And I'm very happy to be involved in this part, bringing the uh, Golden Rule to the East Coast and showing it to you folks and, and what it means to uh, America and the citizens of the United States, which hopefully would be to live in a peaceful and safe world. Uh, thank you. Hello, my name is Ren Jacob. Yeah, I'm from Oregon and let's see, I got involved in Veterans for Peace, around about the time that I heard about the Golden Rule, and that was probably 2010 when they started to rebuild it. Um, let's see, I didn't, didn't have much money to get, but did donate a little bit. But uh, I was in the Air Force too from uh, 1984 till 1990, and I remember from my time in the Air Force that uh, I was pretty certain that the first Gulf War was not necessary. And, you know, long, long stories that I could tell you about that. And, uh, but uh, let's see, I, I think I kind of encouraged the Golden Rule Committee and, and Helen here to bring the Golden Rule up to Oregon, bring it up to the Pacific Northwest, which is where I'm from. And, uh, so they did that in 2016, and uh, I got to be part of the crew there when they got to Portland, and we we sailed along by the Navy ships, and the, there was a Canadian warship, and a few other, a few other uh, things up there. So we sailed by there to try and, you know, show, maybe make people think of some other, other options than just... Uh, aggressively 
show, sh showing that how we can do foreign policy. So that was that's my connection to it, and uh, just just thrilled to be on my fourth fourth chance to crew with the boat now, and and looking forward to another month or more to be associated with it. So thank you. Good afternoon. I'm uh, Mary Ann Van Cura. I'm from Minneapolis, and I'm on the boat because Chapter 25 of the Veterans for Peace harassed Helen and <laughs> offered her money to go to the Upper Mississippi instead of Chicago, which um, I follow Veterans for Peace for 35 years, like the Unitarians, the Quakers, some of our Catholic activist groups and others. They have been this group that's stellar in integrity and really working hard on issues that they've noticed as members of the military that are uh, important for our community. So I was always working on other social justice issues, and um, but watching them. So... Um, my short story is that I told my friend we should go to the powwow on the Mississippi um, in September, and we went to visit with the Vets for Peace who were tabling. And they, I said, what's going on? What are you doing now? They're like, well, you should talk to this guy. He's the captain. We're going to take a boat down the Mississippi and talk about nuclear weapons. I said, that's pretty cool. And... Um, like most people, I just put nuclear in the back of my head as something that wasn't good for us and didn't talk about it. So um, the captain of the Golden Rule said to me, a different captain, he's like, oh, you two should apply to be on the crew. And we're laughing. Well, we don't sail. Sound familiar? We don't sail. Um, and uh, But what was very strange is in uh, 2010, I'd had a goal to boat down the Mississippi from the start to the end. And uh, I had given up that dream. And when he said, started pushing it, I was like, well, here's, I can talk with people and I do care about mission. And my whole fall is free, so I can volunteer. And what was really funny is within three weeks, I was on the boat. Um, and so I'm a fan of following your intuition. Um, and um, I was able to stay with the boat from the start in Minneapolis uh, down to Florida and then left for a while. Right before I left, I got this shark's tooth. You never know when you meet somebody and tell the story, you never know how they'll receive it. And um, this, after a long sharing with someone about our mission, I, I, uh, she shared a shark's tooth from the Chesapeake Bay with me as a gift. And I didn't know then that I'd be coming back to the boat uh, in uh, North Carolina right before you enter the Chesapeake Bay. And uh, so it feels like a second calling. Um, I won't say much more, but I, I will tell you two things that have stood out to me. I love trees and water. I'm on the river all the time with my pets walking them. I didn't know the amount of residue and contamination and weapons left behind. And every city we stopped at, I learned something new. I knew we had super fun sites, I knew we had issues, but I didn't know how common this is and um, how our capitalist structure is promoting this. And the second thing I learned is the efforts of people like the members of this uh, community along the way seem uh, to be, everyone seems to be encouraged by hearing that people in the previous town cared about the same thing. And alone it's very difficult to work, but together what we're doing is right seed planting, trying to create a tipping point till something shifts. And so it feels like nothing when you come to an afternoon event, but it really is something to keep connecting. And uh, that's what I've seen over and over. We are, this is a, we are alone unless we're together, <laughs> right? So I appreciate you and I appreciate being here.
Thank you. I'm Jerry Condon. I'm a Vietnam era veteran who actually refused orders to Vietnam and uh, been involved with the uh, peace movement ever since. Um, I'm active in Veterans for Peace. I'm on the board of directors of Veterans for Peace. And I'm, you know, really proud to be part of the Golden Rule family. But I didn't really have a whole lot of choice because I'm married to the project manager here, <laughs> Helen Jacquard. Um, and, uh, but uh, the, uh, this is really important for Veterans for Peace uh, because our mission is to abolish nuclear weapons and to abolish war. And in the meantime, to restrain our government from intervening overtly and covertly in the internal affairs of other nations. So as you can imagine, uh, we, we're pretty busy. Uh, but it's really important for us to uh, be actualizing our commitment to abolishing nuclear weapons. And uh, the Golden Rule has been a really uh, big and important part of that. And it's really a humbling an inspiring experience because it literally has involved hundreds of people to make it happen. I mean, over an eight-year period, we've been sailing now for eight years with this mission of abolishing nuclear weapons. And um, there have been hundreds of people involved. Actually, we've had maybe 150 crew, volunteer crew over the time. We've had uh, thousands of people have been involved, yeah, organizing at the local level. Uh, but uh, so the Golden Rule family is uh, always growing and uh, now Mel you're part of the Golden Rule family and the rest of you are here and I will acknowledge Ellen Barfield another board member of Veterans for Peace who came from uh, Baltimore to be with us today and uh, thank you very much. Good afternoon. I'm Barbara. Um, I'm not a veteran, but I grew up in Baltimore and I remember my high school days coming down to DC to protest the Vietnam War and there were quite a few returning veterans involved in those protests. And I end up in a five year relationship with one of them. Um, that's a different story. <laughs> um, I'm from Honolulu currently and um, yeah, I had the privilege of being responsible for the Golden Rule when it was uh, stranded in Honolulu, when it really couldn't move anywhere because of COVID. And I think it helped keep my sanity because I needed to go check on, I needed to get out of my house and I had a letter signed by Jerry that I was authorized. And uh, yeah, when the whole city was in quarantine, I was able to travel down to the Alawai, uh, Alawai Harbor and, um, pump the bilge <laughs> and sit inside the cabin for a while while um, I kept the, uh, the motor running for a bit. Anyway, I think it did help keep my sanity. And then uh, I guess what I'm most proud of is that I was able to connect our Marshallese community with the Golden Rule. I mean, once we abandoned uh, the idea, I mean, ma the Marshalls were closed. There was no, they weren't even letting Marshallese people back in the country during COVID. So there was no way to go. So I thought, well, let's bring our local Marshallese community. And we have a quite large community of Micronesians, including Marshallese and Chukis. And um, let's bring the Marshallese to the boat. Um, before the arrival of the Golden Rule, my, my history is I spent 22 years as um, a professor in Japan, and I taught peace studies. And I always started off with Hiroshima, because that's all they know about, the college level students know about World War II. And we use that as a point of departure to talk about reconciliation. Um, a really good friend of mine is Hibaksha, if anybody's familiar with Koko Kondo. She's a dear friend, yes, good. I, I know somebody would know her. <laughs> She's a dynamic person this tall but full of energy. <laughs> um, and I think I would like to share a little bit of my story. I'm not gonna take too long, but I think, it, I think it's unique. And I was inspired to share it for the first time when I was in one of the Senate offices the other day. And we had a, a Air Force staff person He's the only person who actually opened up the NPR and started reading it. And we had a nice 
interesting, engaging discussion, and I just felt moved to share my story. So um, please tell me if anybody else has had a similar experience. I think it may be unique in that I was told that there was an incoming ballistic missile about to hit my city, and I had 20 minutes to shelter in place. And I had to shelter in place and be prepared to be enclosed in an airless space for 14 days, is what we were told it was going to take for the radiation to dissipate enough to be able to breathe the air. So this happened before the Golden Rule came. But we had... This was about, what, four years ago? Or three, four years ago? Yeah. Well, it was when Trump and Kim Jong-il were butting heads, and Kim Jong-il was threatening either Guam or Hawaii. But, you know, of, of course you all know it was a false alarm. And I think we in Hawaii are even a little bit embarrassed to share our stories. Like, did we really believe it or not? But we had two months of preparation where our legislature was telling us, you know, shelter in place, be there, you know, stock up for 14 days. I mean, you know, whoever even thought, I mean, I don't know where they get this information that that's what's necessary and that's what's safe. But we were told that if we're caught outside somewhere and don't have time to shelter in place, we should lay down next to the curb of the street because that would be a little more protection than just standing when the bomb hits. So my personal experience, I was, you know, I was in bed and I got the cell phone, you know, on my cell phone, incoming ballistic missile. This is not a drill. So what do you think? What do you think? We had two months of preparation, what to do when this happens. So I have two cats. I thought, okay, I need kitty litter. I need cat food. I've got an airless room down in my basement. Okay, okay. Um, another thing that started to happen in Honolulu with this threat is we started with the air raid, air raid sirens. Now we have a monthly siren that's a tsunami warning and it's a very different sound and they started to include the old air raid sounds. Those of my generation will remember in schools with that sound. We, we started doing that again the month of December and then January 1st, and then this happened. And after about 20 minutes of me you know, trying to prepare what I was gonna take down to this room, I thought, well, why aren't the sirens going off? And why is my neighborhood deathly quiet? And then I thought to myself, well, I don't really want to spend two weeks in an airless room. I don't want to put my cats through that either. My kids were in Asia. I didn't have to worry about anybody but myself. So I just decided, come what may, I wasn't going anywhere. And so I waited for the impact. And during that time, I was really angry at my younger sister because she had voted for Trump. <laughs> and during that time, when I thought death was imminent, you know, I, I decided to forgive my sister. And I thought, okay, now I'm ready. And then, you know, afterwards when we found out that it was a false alarm and, you know, everybody's kind of denying that we really, you know, fell through it, f fell for it. And, you know, I thought to myself, well, wasn't I so magnanimous? I, I did, I'd forgiven my sister, but then I never did forgive Trump. <laughs> so I still have a long way to go. <laughs> anyway, that's my story. And, um, yeah, that gave me some... Uh, personal experience with uh, anti-nuclear movement to actually think that I was going to be affected thusly. So anyhow, I love the golden rule. I believe it's a magical boat. I think everybody that gets involved is totally incredible. And I feel this is quite a privilege. Thank you for including me.